Somalia, East Africa. U.S. Special Forces on a lightning raid into the heart of Mogadishu. We're going to own this place in a week. And we're Delta, we're Rangers, we're SEALs. Like, we need to take this place down. Two Black Hawk helicopters are brought down by a hostile militia. And at that point, we all knew that the mission had changed. 99 U.S. soldiers are trapped in the city overnight as armed Somalis close in on their positions. Now, investigators have to understand why a routine mission went so badly wrong as the U.S. military suffer their worst casualties since the Vietnam War. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. October the 3rd, 1993. Task Force Ranger, an elite American team of 160 soldiers, are waiting to be briefed on their next raid into the lawless capital of Somalia. Get it on! Their ultimate mission is to capture or kill rogue warlord General Mohammed Aidid and bring his rebel clan to heel. Local intelligence sources have identified high-value targets, clansmen loyal to Idid, gathering in a location downtown. Today, the Rangers are going to bring them in, dead or alive. 1532. From their base inside the city airport, Black Hawk and Little Bird helicopters take off laden with Ranger and Elite Delta operators. We came in off the ocean, and then you start seeing like those shanty huts on the outskirts of the town, and then all of a sudden you hit the city. Black Hawk Super 6-4, they prepare themselves for the assault. Matt Eversman is a 26-year-old sergeant, leading his men for the first time. All of a sudden, the helicopter pilot, you know, informed us that we were going to make the assault. And this emotional rush of adrenaline, and we're going to go from 2,000 feet or so above sea level down to, to 40 feet. And, I mean, it's the most incredibly exciting, scary ride that you could, could imagine. The target of the raid is a three-story building in the hostile heart of Mogadishu. The assault team expect to be in and out in about 30 minutes. Our plan was to establish a cordon around that building and then we would uh, bring the Delta people in in the smaller helicopters right in on top of the building uh, and we would go in and capture those people. 1542. When in position, the Rangers will fast rope down from the hovering Black Hawks. They are divided into four teams known as chalks. Each chalk is to secure a different corner of the building. The problem is you couldn't see anything dirt and dust everywhere and it's spitting up everywhere and it's swirling into the aircraft and you're seeing all this dirt swirl and you can't, you're just getting glimpses of rooftops and you can't you don't know where you're at in chalk four's helicopter the pilot says we're in the wrong spot we've stopped short of where we were going to insert you and with that the ropes were thrown from the helicopter <laughs> Chalk 4 will have to move into position when they hit the ground.
probably halfway down the fast rope and saw the body of one of our rangers, young Todd Blackburn, you know, lying on the ground. And my first instinct is that we're taking fire and somebody's already been shot. And I haven't even gotten on the ground. The casualty makes it impossible for them to move. Maddox turns to me and says, he didn't get shot, he fell. Lost control. At the time, I thought he was dead. Uh, he was bleeding out of his mouth and nose and ears and just in a horrible shape. Chalk 4 need to get to the target building to protect the rest of the assault force, but they're pinned down a block to the north. The Delta Force assault team penetrates the target building and searches for ID's henchmen. At the same time, a large extraction convoy arrives at the target building. Its job is to bring everybody back home, the Delta and Ranger teams and their prisoners. This is Uniform 64. We're in position for extraction. Over. In the lead vehicle is Battalion Commander Danny McKnight. I got to the holding position I was supposed to be at. I could see the target building, and then I was just waiting for the call. The Black Hawks offer surveillance and fire support. They're taking incoming rounds. Black Hawk Super 65 is piloted by Jerry Izzo. Could hear rounds cracking past the aircraft, and uh, I heard two explosions, two thunderclap explosions that just went boom, boom. But all the other aircraft were moving and maneuvering and jinking very hard uh, to avoid getting hit. But Sometimes you, you can't get, you can't miss all the raindrops when it's raining. 1,600. 23 Somalis are taken, including two of Idid's most senior henchmen. The force prepares to pull out with the prisoners. Three vehicles from the extraction convoy are dispatched north to rendezvous with Chalk 4, where Todd Blackburn lies hurt. From his position in the Joint Operations Center, Raid Commander Colonel Jerry Boykin watches the mission on a live feed from Black Hawks hovering above the battle. Colonel McKnight, go ahead and take the detainees and take them back to base. Roger that. They captured the people they went after very quickly with uh, relatively little resistance and uh, were ready to extract them uh, quicker than I had expected, actually. That mission was done. We were already thinking about going home. Like I'm, I'm thinking, wow, man, we were combat veterans. This is crazy. I wonder if they're going to give us a badge, you know? And that's what we're all thinking. It's, it's time to go home. But as the assault teams wait for the signal to extract, more Somalis converge on the target area. I was far away from that place, and I came running there. I saw so many injured people and a scene of great disaster. It was a massacre. I couldn't count the corpses. That destruction didn't just affect me physically, but also affected me mentally. I saw it with my own eyes. We're in a fight. We're in a heavy fight. It is a unbelievably deafening cacophony of, of sound.
gunfire is so loud that your, your teeth hurt. Your ears hurt, your, your jaw hurts. I've never, ever um, witnessed any, any kind of sensation as to how loud that the battlefield was that day. We are in a bare knuckle fight you know, with these people that aren't gonna stop. And the only thing that's gonna make them stop is one of our bullets or more violence. In the sky above, the circling Black Hawks are also in trouble. The area was getting hotter and hotter, more, more automatic weapons fire, more RPG fire. And uh, we're sitting there, we're all tensing up, going, come on, come on, come on, let's hurry up, let's get this over with, get them on the trucks, let's get them out of here. Sixteen twenty. I still remember the visual of the, of the bird starting to turn off, and the way that it appeared to me was, wow, and it looks like he's going down, but that couldn't possibly be happy. I saw it with my own eyes. I was extremely excited and happy when I saw the Black Hawk crashing. I looked up, and I saw pieces flying off this Black Hawk, and I just saw it twisting and spiraling. And at that point, we all knew that the mission had changed. The Black Hawk has crashed three blocks northeast of the target building. Crowds of Somalis race towards the crash site. As I was looking down through that other block in position, there were hordes of people running towards where that aircraft had went down. And you start getting this feeling that we didn't have a lot of time to get down there. The extraction convoy is diverted straight to the crash site. Right, right, right! En route, they pick up some of the out of position chalk four. Roger, I do have Colonel McKnight pulls up in his Humvee. So we load all of our men up, get on these vehicles, and start to head out towards this crash site. Chalk Team 2 is on foot, also trying to get to the crash site and the safety of the extraction convoy. And I heard a yell. Ah! And what I'd just seen was Earl Fillmore, a Delta operator. He was just shot in the head. And another round had struck Lieutenant Lechner in the shin. I remember looking across the street and thinking, man, how did that just happen to the Delta operator? Because you know he's doing everything right. You keep it down, but you start feeling it. Because you're like, oh my gosh, it, th we're not foolproof. We're not the Superman. There's a kink in the armor. 1640. Hey, are you okay? A second helicopter, Black Hawk Super 6-4, Piloted by Mike Durant is hit.
hostile crowds begin moving towards the second crash site. Well, it was about 1,800 meters from the first crash site. We had sent everybody to the first crash site. I don't think would have ever entered our mind that we could lose two in one day. Two Delta snipers providing fire support from another chopper request to be dropped at the second crash site to protect the injured crew. There was nothing to support them with. It would be two guys against an unknown number of uh, Somali militiamen. I had to deny. their chances of coming out alive were not good. In fact, we even posed that question to them. Do you understand? Yes, they said. But as Somalis close in on the crash site, Colonel Boykin realizes he has no other options. Put them in. He needs to buy the injured crew some time. is still trapped in the maze of streets. Unable to get to either crash site. We go through this hellacious fight and the situation I described with these Somalis on both sides of the street shooting at each other. One of our lead vehicles was moving up a, a road. An RPG uh, flew over the hood. Another ambush, another series of casualties. We're probably as close to non-mission capable as we can, given the casualties and our uh, status. Convoy, severely decimated, abandons its search for the first downed Black Hawk and begins fighting its way back to the American base. The injured pilot of the second downed Black Hawk, Mike Durant, is defended by just two Delta snipers, Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon. Mike told us later that Randy Shugart yelled out, Gordy, I'm hit. And then his gun went silent. Somali crowds overrun the second crash site. They set upon the survivors and the bodies of the Delta snipers. As Mike describes it, the next thing he saw was just a wave of people that swept over him and he was knocked unconscious. The main convoy, badly battered, returns to base. 99 Rangers and Delta remain in the city, trapped and surrounded in positions around the first downed Black Hawk. As darkness descends, the men are forced to find shelter off the hostile streets. We were kind of angry that it had come down to this where we were sort of on the defensive. I mean, we were, we were, I mean, we were the Rangers. We had Delta. It was 160th up in the air. Like, there's no way that these guys could have us on the retreat. It's crazy. It only takes one grenade to be thrown into that room, and everybody in the room would have been killed. It's a scary mental state to be in when 
you know, you very well might not live uh, through the night. Thousands of militiamen launch wave after wave of attacks on ranger positions. Little Bird helicopters are dispatched in a desperate bid to hold the Somalis back. Whenever the Little Birds would come over and they'd do their gun runs, it would light the sky up, much like lightning. Um, and the rockets would, would sound like thunder, and you would have brass raining on you. When he lit up the street, you could you catch glimpses of the shadow men that were out there moving. And one, there were more of them than we thought. Two, they were closer than we thought they were. 2315. A giant convoy leaves the US base on the outskirts of the city. Made up of Pakistani tanks and Malaysian armored vehicles, along with the men from the Rangers and 10th Mountain Division, this new convoy's mission is to save the trapped men. Lieutenant Larry Moores leads a contingent of rangers back into the city. They knew uh, what type of fight it was, and they knew uh, that it was going to be a, a long haul as we went back in. We need to get in there and, uh, and, and, and do our, our mission. One fifty-five. Larry Moore's vehicles reach the second crash site. They find no survivors and no bodies. Minutes later, the rescue convoy reaches the trapped ranger force near the first crash site. As the dead and wounded are loaded into vehicles, rescue teams try to free the body of pilot Cliff Walcott. They had to put the wounded guys in the vehicles, and that took a lot of time, and they would put the dead on top of the vehicles. They were long gone. They weren't feeling any pain anymore. Surprisingly, it was pretty quiet. There wasn't a lot of gunfire. Then all of a sudden, bam! Game back on. There were probably eight guys packed into this vehicle. We're all wounded, stained blood and sweat. And I leaned over my shoulder and I said, all right, dude, step on the gas. Let's get the hell out of here. What I didn't know was that they were still trying to extract Cliff Walcott's body. No one was going to leave until we got them out of there. So they stayed until they were able to pull the airplane apart. 542. The rescue convoy is finally ready to leave. But with the vehicles packed with 10th Mountain and UN forces, as well as casualties, not all of the rangers can fit on board. The small band of rangers who haven't been injured in the battle have to travel on foot. It was unthinkable. In theory, we're supposed to run beside the armor in order to be shielded. As soon as we started down the first block, the armor left us. A band of rangers and Delta operators have to run what becomes known as the Mogadishu Mile all the way to the UN-controlled football stadium. Miraculously, there is no further loss of life. I watched a, a five-ton truck come back in on the airfield, uh, and there were bodies in that truck, dead and wounded. I walked over to the truck to help lower the tailgate, and the, uh, when the tailgate came down, blood poured out the back of it. So from an emotional perspective, it was, uh, it was a devastating blow to me to uh, see those people who I was responsible for. 18 US soldiers are dead and 84 injured. Black Hawk pilot Mike Durant has been taken hostage and is being held in an unknown location. Mike Durant, US Army. Estimates of Somali fatalities range from 500 to 1,000. T-34 
TV pictures of dead US soldiers being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu provoke shock and outrage in America. Now, by rewinding the events of that day, we can reveal how a poorly organized and badly equipped militia was able to take on some of the best trained soldiers on the planet. Move! US troops had initially been sent to Somalia as part of a UN force on a humanitarian mission in March of the previous year. Their task was to protect and distribute supplies in Operation Restore Hope. Let's make sure the crowds aren't jumping on, stealing the grain. Uh, they're getting a little more unruly every day, so we need to go out there and provide security. Robert Oakley was U.S. Special Envoy to Somalia at the time of Operation Restore Hope. The military force to Restore Hope had shown that they could meet any challenge and deal with it swiftly and partially. Co-chaired by the United States and the United Nations, uh, the civilian and the military all working together. The country was doing pretty well. But in August 1993, the mission changed under a new White House administration. Now, rather than just protect and distribute supplies, US troops went after the man they felt was the biggest threat, not just to aid, but to the stability of the whole country. We were deployed into Somalia, uh, to Mogadishu, the capital city there, to capture and ultimately bring to justice a notorious clan leader named Muhammad Faria Deed. The American public demanded to know why this new mission then went so badly wrong. And why the Somalis were holding pilot Mike Durant hostage. Oakley was sent back to the country in the aftermath of October the 4th and was instrumental in securing the release of captured pilot Mike Durant. And new brothers and task force ranger, freedom never tasted so good. We're here! <laughs> Oakley believes the whole strategy to take down Ideed was flawed from the beginning. If they'd taken him, somebody else would have moved up to take his place and the fighting would have gotten worse. The UN and US made it clear to Ideed that he could play no part in the future of Somalia. Once you remove that hope and it became clear to him that the United States and the United Nations was going to tolerate Ideed as leader of Somalia, he said, well, okay, I'll have to do something else to get their attention. You know, that's a fairly human sentiment, it's not just Somali. I am part of my people suffering, killing, I'm sharing with them. Mark Bowden, author of best-selling account Black Hawk Down, interviewed many of the Rangers and Delta soldiers that were there that day, as well as members of IDED's militia. I think the Somali people were still divided in the spring of 1992. There were many who welcomed the presence of the UN, who, who were hopeful. When they first entered the country, they brought aid. We welcomed them, and we waved flowers. By summer of 1993, this mixed picture had changed. One event back in July brought people together from across clan lines. The UN, at one point, surrounded a building where uh, a number of top clan leaders were meeting to, as it happens, to discuss whether or not to support Ideed in his effort against the UN. The UN were determined to punish Ideed's militia for the slaying of 24 Pakistani peacekeeping troops the previous month. The clan meeting seemed to provide a perfect opportunity. Osman Atta was Ideed's main financial backer. He remembers the day of the raid well. They just came in with an helicopter and started shooting. There were no arm cuts, as they claim it. Unfortunately, they sh killed 73, 72 elders. Unaware of the growing tension, the elite Ranger and Delta Force landed six weeks later. Their operations in the city further incensed the people of Mogadishu. 
we weren't there to feed anybody. Put him on the ground! Can you imagine just hanging out there and all of a sudden helicopters come in and rope in and dudes come in and start kicking in your door and telling you to get down, do this, that, do that? I'd be surprised if anyone didn't want us out of there. With heightened tensions on the streets of Mogadishu, any ranger operation would rely on accurate intelligence. Robin Horsfall is one of the youngest soldiers ever to be accepted into the SAS regiment, Britain's special forces. A veteran of countless IRA encounters on the streets of Northern Ireland. And of the 1980 Iranian hostage release mission. And Horsfall believes that against this background of rising hostility, there were a number of key tactical mistakes made, starting with the assault plan itself. The assault plan on the building was fairly simple. The Black Hawk helicopters came in and the, the Rangers fast roped down on four different corners around the target building. At the same time, Delta Force came in on the Little Bird helicopters, jumped out the helicopters and carried out the assault on the main building. It was a plan that could rapidly be put into action any time General Ideed and his henchmen showed their faces. Class Force Ranger needed an immediate action plan. They needed something that they could use at a moment's notice to deploy quickly onto the ground. If they had to take a long time and make long preparations, then there was a good chance that the target wasn't going to be where intelligence had said he would be. The simpler you keep it, the better it is. It doesn't mean that you can't change something up. You're not gonna do it exactly the same way every time, but it's called having a template. The basic template had worked numerous times before, but not this time, and Horsfall has a theory why. In the 70s and 80s, when we were working against the IRA in Northern Ireland, we were always taught that we didn't uh, repeat anything. Well, every time you repeat a mission and re repeat the same template, what you do is you give information to the enemy. It meant once the militia knew where the rangers were heading, they were ready. As the ranger chalks inserted, Battle Overwatch relayed reports of militia massing in the target area. They uh, told us that there were people on the, on the objective. They'd seen heavy weapon systems, they'd seen machine guns, they'd seen people, so they knew we were coming, so this was gonna be a little bit hotter. Ideed's militia also had a counter strategy to try to bring down a Black Hawk helicopter suck in the rangers to the crash site and surround the area with hostile militia. I did had actually thought, well, if they bring in the helicopters again, if they mount an assault with the same pattern as before, we're going to be prepared for it. We're going to put RPG-7s in the surrounding area and use those uh, to attack any helicopters that are coming in. I did should not have been underestimated. We used uh, all the means available to the Somalis to shoot down the helicopter because helicopters, he was our main enemy. The Ranger Force didn't think a primitive rocket-propelled grenade was capable of bringing down a Black Hawk. It had never happened before, but Aideed had identified a weakness he could exploit. In the 1980s, Afghan Mojahideen had had some success in bringing down large Soviet hind helicopters with well-aimed RPGs. The RPG-7 is a very, very simple rocket-propelled grenade. The most vulnerable part of any helicopter is the tail rotor. If you punch a hole in the fuselage, it's going to go through, out the other side, not cause any serious damage. But once you take out the tail rotor, the helicopter is completely out of control and will crash. You completely underestimated their ability to take a helicopter out of the sky with an RPG. We thought, OK, the helicopter goes down, it's going to be due to mechanical failure. They had figured it out. If they could take down a helicopter, they could collapse the city around us. But for Horsfall, the critical moment was the downing of the second helicopter. Task Force Ranger only had 160 men on the ground. They deployed all those forces to the first crash site to create a secure zone there. They had no way of splitting that force and deploying them onto the ground to the second crash site. The Rangers were sucked into a street battle they weren't prepared or equipped for and faced a determined enemy 
that they had badly underestimated. And there was guys running around in the back of Toyota pickup trucks with flip-flops. And we're like, and there was one dude with a football helmet on. We're like, dude, this is a joke. We're gonna own this place in, in a week. You know, we're Delta, we're Rangers, we're Air Force, we're SEALs. Like, we're gonna take this place down. Somalis are very brave people. And they will defend themselves and their country. I'm sure uh, Rangers were very good soldiers. But they underestimated Somalis. That was among the many mistakes they ever made. The small assault force found themselves in isolated positions in the city, surrounded by a militia fighting on familiar streets. Well, if we look at the target area, for example, we can see here that the buildings are very densely packed together. The chances are you only got, got, got enough width for one vehicle to move along these roads. That means that people can drop grenades, fire immediately down on top of you. You can easily be ambushed. Once you get in there as well, it's very easy to get lost. Street fighting is one of the most costly forms of fighting in any kind of war. And most generals try, try to avoid fighting in towns. Mogadishu has been in an almost permanent state of conflict since the overthrow of President Saeed Bari in 1991. There is no effective government, police or infrastructure. It's left the streets a battleground. You know, every door, every window, every alley is a threat. They are fighting in darkness. Everything is as enemy. The trees are enemy, the suns are enemy. The poor guys cannot fight with someone in, in his hometown. Traditionally, the U.S. has used overwhelming firepower to even up the fight against greater numbers on their home patch. But Horsfall believes that it was exactly these types of weapons that weren't available to the Ranger Force. They didn't have helicopter gunships. They didn't have rockets. They didn't have artillery and armor. And consequently, their decisions to carry out aggressive operations of this nature without those support elements actually made them a very, very weak force on the ground. We asked for the AC-130 gunship. We had confidence in it. And we knew that if we got into a really bad situation, that that could be uh, really a, a, a deciding factor. Uh, we were denied that. Requests to the US government for armor to be sent to Somalia were also denied. Had we had a more robust vehicle, a vehicle with armor protection, we could have gone through those streets much faster and uh, much safer. So they put us into this environment and then did not give us what we said was needed to do our mission there. Without armor or heavy air support, the Rangers were forced to rely on more vulnerable and less offensively capable Humvees on Black Hawk helicopters. Those decisions made at political levels didn't take into consideration the tactical effect on the ground. Once again, US leadership had made a critical miscalculation of the scale of the task. It wasn't just those at the top who underestimated the Somalis' ability to mount such a large counterattack. Soldiers on the ground also made critical planning mistakes. <laughs> The raid was designed to take less than an hour, so they left behind heavy body armor plates, night vision equipment, and even canteens of water. It seems as if everybody had taken loss of their senses, but at the time, it, it truly was thinking it was for the good of this mission. We'll be lighter, we'll be able to go. I kind of looked at, at uh, Jeff and I said, okay, what time is it? 
2.30. I said, okay, how long do missions last? About 45 minutes. Okay, all right. Now, why are you gonna take night vision goggles when it's a daytime mission? Bad idea. Once the night came down, they were left as a very small force surrounded by an enemy with vastly superior numbers. And had they taken those night viewing goggles, they would have had an advantage that could have made a huge difference to the amount of casualties taken. Now, we can reveal the chain of events that led to America's biggest loss of life in combat since the Vietnam War. 68 minutes to disaster. An elite assault force is sent on a raid into a hostile Mogadishu. Underestimating the Somalis, they run with a plan they've used before. Go, 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 go. Forty minutes to disaster. Poor intelligence leaves them facing an enraged enemy who know they're coming. 20 minutes to disaster. The Somalis deliberately target American Black Hawk helicopters with RPGs. 61, it's going down. The troops defend the downed aircraft. Seconds to disaster. A second Black Hawk is hit. The ground troops can't defend both sites. They've been dragged into a street fight. They can't win. What started as a routine mission has descended into a desperate fight for survival. 18 US soldiers lie dead, and another 84 are wounded. The mission was militarily a success. The targets were captured, and huge losses were inflicted on IDEED's militia. But the Rangers' casualties and TV pictures of bodies being dragged through the streets forced the withdrawal of all American forces from Somalia. When you're sending a group of American soldiers to a place like Somalia, which most Americans couldn't even find on a map in 1993, with the idea that they're, you know, just doing this humanitarian gesture at the behest of the UN, there's a very low tolerance for uh, loss of life in, an, in a mission like that. The suddenness of the withdrawal left many in Task Force Ranger bitter. I don't think there was a man there that wasn't angry and disappointed that uh, we were being pulled out. This particular time, on that particular day, it was the wrong call. And it's hard to look at a father of a soldier who's been killed on the streets and, you know, try and make some, some sense out of it. We knew that we would leave Mogadishu and, and always regret that we didn't accomplish our ultimate mission, which was to capture Muhammad Adi. As good as we are, someone's getting killed. Someone's going to die. People are going to get hurt. People are going to be wounded. And you're going to lose folks. When you send them into a combat situation, it's going to happen. You better know that whatever it is that you sent them in there to go do is worth that to you and that it's worth it to the nation. Today, Somalia remains a battleground of rival clans and is still ravaged by famine. Despite continuing UN and African Union intervention, it seems no closer to a lasting solution to its many problems. Brand new Seconds from Disaster examines a Chinook helicopter crash next Monday at 9. Next, it's one of air crash investigation's most extreme crashes.